getting everything tuned up volume wise. Okay, excellent, thank you. All right, so I will first confess that I, I am nervous. It is one thing to talk to first year students and it's another thing to talk to fellow educators who know about teaching and the sins that I'm about to commit uh, explicitly or implicitly. And, uh, but let's, let's just get into this and see what happens. All right, I'm just testing some of the hardware here. All right, so the big picture. You're gonna have lots of sessions during the rest of the day where you go into active learning, you go into the nitty gritty about being a TA, you go into the details of how to run a course management system. But to me, plenary talks are about, wait, what, what are we doing this all for? What's the purpose of this? What motivates us? What get us, gets us out of bed when the time comes? Um, and what gets me out of bed is talking to these large rooms and seeing the impact of teaching on students, especially at, I would say, well, I haven't taught elementary school. I'm sure they grow a lot during that period too. But during university from first year to fourth year, just seeing the maturity, the evolution of their skills, their evolution of their thinking processes, and just what they can do, it's staggering. It's, it's an amazing transformation to be a witness to and to be part of and to help facilitate. Um, in terms of more pragmatic things that I've done, usually I teach large first year classes. Uh, I used to teach out at West Campus, the 600 seat auditorium, uh, which was basically a theater, and more recently it's like a 200 seat in here kind of size for the first year engineers, a lot of math courses, uh, statistics developing. We actually went through a whole project, the award that they mentioned was uh, developing an online system for teaching statistics across 800 students. So the, the struggle continues, the struggle continues. Um, the things, that I really get excited by in terms of the teaching are active learning, for sure. So big proponent of that, you're gonna get subjected to a little bit more of that as we go through this uh, time together. How to assess students, the challenge of how do you transform the classroom experiences into something that we can as an institution validate. It's the least fun part of the job often, but it's also one of the responsibilities of educators, especially in an accreditation-based institution like a university. So that's something to think about all the time, is not just how to teach, but how to close the loop and make sure that the teaching has been successful for as many students as possible. Um, my, big, my big theme in terms of my own teaching philosophy is teach, it's course alignment, making sure that every piece of the course ties together in a way that is transparent to the students, that doesn't feel like there's extra cruft, that there's extra cognitive load for the students trying to wade through. What do you want from me here? You know, trying to make everything as easy as possible so that the entire struggle, or as much of the struggle as possible, just comes from doing the hard learning about the material, about the ideas, and less so about, wait, how do I get through on cue to get to the quiz I need to take by midnight? Nah, you don't want that kind of barrier in front of your students if it doesn't have to be there. Um, yeah, that's. And if anyone knows any good, actually, that was the one thing. If anyone knows, computer science-wise, about how to run online tests for students on computer-based tests, I'd love to hear that. That is my current struggle with the assessment and integrity when you have students using computers. So that is, yeah, that's my personal struggle. If anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them. Uh, also, just to give you a fair warning, because of my background, there may be a bias towards math and large class stuff. So if you have the luxury of teaching 10 students in a small room and having a seminar, oh, I'm so jealous. But uh, if you see some tendencies, that's where it's coming from. Now, I think one of the most important things about teaching is making sure that you're connecting with who you're teaching to, and I don't know who you all are. So we're gonna do a quick little check in here, and I realize librarians. Librarians should have been like first one on the list. I apologize, we'll, we'll get them in there. Uh, but just raise your hand right now if you are a staff developer, team support, that person. Excellent, okay. Again, everyone else in the room, look at them. They're the people you want to go to for expertise, not just experience, but actual like trained knowledge. Uh, TAs that know they're facing students, like leading tutorials. Perfect, okay, went over there, excellent. Uh, instructors. Front of the classroom, oh, we have a good person. Oh, okay, everywhere, fantastic, all right. Uh, the backroom TAs, the ones who get it done, there we go, yeah, grading, processing documents, getting the website up, excellent. Uh, anyone who still doesn't know what their job is because their department hasn't told them yet? <laughs> a couple of them, like, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know who my TAs are right now, so I know in our department it's in flux, so good luck, week one will be a treat. <laughs> uh, librarians, there's librarians in the crowd. I guess not one hander. Okay. All right. Any other kind of roles that I missed there? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. 
you know, provost, <laughs> heads of teaching and learning. Yeah, I guess those are important too. <laughs> Any other roles? How about experience in your role? So what I'm gonna do here, is I'm, I'm gonna draw a little laser beam because we have multiple screens here, and I'm just gonna draw it across. And just raise your hand when you hit the one that's, that describes you best, do you think? So I'll give you a moment to pick your moment, pick your threshold there. Uh, so first timers, okay. Enthusiastic novices, a couple times around, excellent. The ones who've been through this grind before, a few. Yeah, there we go, of oh, the sap there. And the seasoned pros, there we go, all right. Okay, so we do have a lot of novices. Let's say the mix is down at the getting started, which is exciting because that's where you actually learn more, I would say. You're, you're more open to learning as opposed to the, the crusty veterans who are like, yeah, I've done this before. Uh, like nothing to teach me now. Uh, all right. What I, was gonna, what I was trying to do as I prepared this was try to think of some historical context. And of course, because we're looking at big picture, we're looking at the institution, the university, uh, it made sense to look at what is a university. And of course, it comes from Latin. It was a phrase, it sort of picked out of the phrase, I can't speak Latin, so universitas magistorum et scholarium, something like that, uh, which translates as a community of teachers and scholars. And you'll conveniently notice that Students aren't mentioned in that list, which seems a bit odd. And I was wondering, well, maybe the scholars are the students. And I'm like, that seems a little highbrow. Uh, I doubt that. Um, but if it's not, then wait, what was the point? So the students to me are obviously the essential reason, raison d'etre of teaching. Uh, there is no learning without the teaching. There's no teaching without the learning. And so I thought about, okay, this isn't very helpful. The historical perspective is lovely, but let's talk about the modern day. And as was mentioned earlier, we really have if you push comes to shove and two words come about universities, it's research and it's teaching. Those are the two pillars of the institution. What I come to you today with is a bit of good news, which is when we look at budgets and we look at who brings in the money, who's, who's the big donor to this university, it happens to be the learning people. <laughs> Student fees, yay, most of our money comes from student fees. Oh wait, we also get a bunch of operating grants from the government. All that comes from student side. And if we go even one step further, grad students, raise your hands. Perfect, yes. You get paid the money out of the grants to do the research and also teach at the same time. So I would say about 70-30 is the ratio that we can really attribute of the one, we're a $1 billion institution. U of T is like a $3 billion a year institution. It blows my mind, uh, the scale of it. But 70-30 is about teaching. Yeah, the research is there, we do that, but if you look, if you follow the money, uh, teaching is really where it's at. So pat yourselves in the back for contributing to that part of the success and health financially of the institution. That being said, <laughs> if you take a look at opportunities to network, to connect, to be a part of an activity, there's a whole website dedicated to research and finding networks of research, people who are doing the same kinds of things as you, and you might bridge the gap. Easy to find that. It's actually quite fun to explore. But if I think about my day-to-day -day teaching network, it's basically one or two people, and honestly, that's probably bigger than most people's day-to-day -day teaching network. Usually, you just kind of sit in your room, you answer your emails, you plan your lectures, you do your thing, and students, you interact with students a lot, but not in the same way as you talk about research with colleagues. In fact, I want to get at that with another little scrolling session here. If you think about a work conversation, and let's not think about today, today's gonna to be an exception, but think about week seven of the, of the term. You're in the grind, things are going on, things are stabilized, and you meet with one of your colleagues. Think of all the colleagues that you meet. Where do you put yourself on the, I spent most of my time talking about research, and we'll go with left to right, show of hands. 100% about research, uh, 75, 25, okay, 50, 50? Oh, you guys have a great life, okay. Uh, 20, 25, 75, really fantastic. Well, that is exciting, I'm talking to the right crowd here. All right, um, this is fantastic. Because I honestly, on a day to day, it's probably around here. Like a lot of talk with the grad students, a lot of talk with about the research side. Not talking about the logistics of teaching, like who's gonna cover what lecture, that kind of thing, what material, but not, not the good stuff. Not the deep stuff that you get into with the research side. So, excellent. So that, if you can encourage that, if you can keep that going, I think that would be fantastic. Uh, because I also think that days like today, and also all the workshops that were <laughs> advertised and are available later on, those are a fantastic opportunity to keep those conversations going and just keep it 
front of mind. There's this little theme throughout the year of, wait, what am I doing when I'm teaching? What's the purpose? What, what am I trying to do? How can I do it better at every stage? I think it's a really powerful uh, way to keep that alive in a way that can be uh, difficult if you're just doing it by yourself. So kudos to you. All right. Now, <laughs> as, as Matt and uh, Gavin were doing their Matthew and Gavin were doing their talks, I'm like, oh, they're stealing all my good stuff. <laughs> but no, there's themes. They were following the same themes. It's echoing. It's great. Uh, so if you can find somebody else nearby, and I want to focus on one question. So talk to them quickly about anything else about teaching and learning, but what brought you to here today? And if the answer is my department said I had to come, that's totally fine. So yeah, pick somebody else and ask them what they did or why they're here today. You might have to move a little bit or just kind of move one seat over to finish it up. All righty, welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. All right, this is one of my challenges in classrooms too, is you get people talking and they don't want to stop. And like, that's awesome. <laughs> I can do the hand thing. I'm trying to be slightly more subtle than with my first year students who know how to be quiet. <laughs> Here's that. All right. So I've got a couple side tips as we go through this. And uh, one of them is, this is why I like active learning. Quite frankly, the classroom now, well not now, like five seconds ago, was just so much more fun to be in, I hope for you as well, than with me talking. Like it's just, it's, it also gives me a chance to go and talk to the students in a way that uh, I wouldn't otherwise. So if, you have a ch if you're lucky enough to be a TA or an instructor who get gets a chance to incorporate some active learning, I think you'll find it incredibly rewarding. And it can be done in large classes, usually through clicker kind of systems. If you're interested in that, uh, I'm always happy to have a conversation about how to make that work. All right. Um, what did, going back to that historical quote or that definition of the university, one thing I thought was important was that idea of community. So whether we have students in the mix or not, the fact is that we are a community. And that, especially at university, I think university holds a special place and in people's minds and the psyches and the kind of what teaching and learning means. So I just want you to think about that for a second or two. Uh, the example that jumped to my mind, well, to my personal experience, I'll give you that first, uh, is just walking to a library. When I was preparing for this talk, I thought I should look up some historical things. So where do you go? You go to the library. And as a math person, I don't go to the library that often, I'll be honest. Uh, and you just, it's a temple. It is a temple of knowledge. And it just, it, hit, anyway, it hits me. And it, yeah, it just makes the institution feel real in a way that might not otherwise. And I was just reading the story about uh, the history of, I'm playing here. Name, sorry. Yvonne Brill, who was one of the uh, first propulsion engineers in the 1950s, 60s for rockets. And her seminal moment was growing up in Winnipeg and going to Un University of Manitoba and just seeing the buildings and the structure and feeling, this is where I want to be to spend my time. So yeah, just think about that. Just take 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and think about what, what, what brings you joy about being in a university, whether it's about teaching and learning or rooms or what. And we're only gonna do 20 seconds because I don't have the patience that Gavin has. <laughs> All right. So is there anyone who cares to share theirs? And I'm gonna ask Carolyn to have the microphone. So if you just raise your hand if you're interested in sharing, please, thanks. And if you're on this side, that's totally fine. We can get across to you. Go ahead. I think for me, it's books. I come, I'm a first generation university person <laughs> and I come from a very small town in Northern Ontario and we always just really liked books and coming to an institution that just also loves books and learning and, and values that as a personality trait, I guess, uh, is very exciting and sharing what you learn with others and learning it from them and meeting other people who love to learn is just super exciting. Cool. Uh, exactly. That community, that community of learning just inherent or through the transition of the books. Absolutely. Any other, any other thoughts maybe on this side? Yeah, please. A couple over here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, I love being in university. There is, uh, like, uh, in university, there is a very addictive feeling. Like, when you learn something new, it's you feel a sense of achievement. And it's uh, extremely, like, rewarding and extremely a uh, sense of achievement, which is very addictive. 
and that's why I want to uh, be here again and again in the university. <laughs> I hear that resonates. Raise your hand if that's sort of something you've experienced. Like, yeah, I want to get some more of that. <laughs> sweet, sweet learning. Yeah, one more. <laughs> um, I like centers of learning because of just the power of a question. And I found in my own journey too, where you have a question which leads to like discovering more answers, but then those new answers give you another question. And I think when I see students or people ask a really good question, that just opens up a whole door to a new way of learning. And I think that happens in the community really well. Excellent. And I like the fact that that sort of ties into the, okay, if I've got one more question, I learn one more thing. Oh, there's another question. This can go on forever. I can keep this high going for a whole career. This is great. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So that, again, sometimes, again, week seven, when you're marking your 400th paper, think back to that moment where you're like, right, <laughs> there's a community that cares about teaching and learning, and this is just one step along the road to making that happen for as many people as we can. Um, all right. Getting back to the actual teaching side for a moment then. So as a TA, as an instructor, as anyone, a course designer, the temptation is to look at a course and think, this is my course, I can do it. It's, it's this big thing that has content, it has activities, it has assessments in it, and it looms large in your psyche. However, it's important to remember when you're in that perspective is that we do all that work and then we think about the students and Going for historical quotes again because we can. Uh, let you enjoy. <laughs> if someone had to guess at the the century, let's say when this came out, <laughs> yeah, seventeenth century. century. Good tavern, absolutely. <laughs> any other any other guesses? <laughs> yeah, please. Fifteenth to sixteenth. Fifteenth sixteenth, and one more. Ancient Greece, oh, interesting. I didn't, yeah, I was looking for university quotes. I probably could have found some if I'd just gone for like the institutes, uh, but this is actually even earlier, that's in between, 1300s. So this is a thing, right? <laughs> Students and wanting to learn, and I think just remembering that learning is hard, right? It, it's fun, it's rewarding, but it takes effort, and sometimes it's easier to go to the tavern, as we all do from time to time. So uh, what I would say from that quote that, bothered me a little bit is, and it's, I catch myself doing this all the time, uh, when, you, when, I, when I complain, I mean, no, when I, when I share about the experience of my students with my wife, uh, just remembering it's some students drove me nuts today, <laughs> not students suck. Uh, just keeping that in mind, it helps balance it and makes you remember that it, there's, there's all kinds of people in the room. And if some people are excellent, if some people are excellent, and we can feed that, and some people are struggling, that's fair, we can, but just remember that some students as opposed to all students. Um, but that's, a, I think the important thing is that when we talk about a course, we have to keep in perspective that it's big for us, but it's not necessarily big for students. And I would take a mathematical take on this and say that the student perspective on a course is almost orthogonal to the way, it's almost perpendicular to the way that we as teachers look at it. We're focused on all the structure, the assessments, the pieces going together, the alignment, uh, a lot about content. And the students are like, how do I get through this? Like really, that for a lot of them, especially in first year, it's just how do I navigate this, this thing that is a course? And they tend naturally to be unsympathetic about the amount of work you have to do as a teacher because they're not doing that. They're doing their own work. And it's just a very different ex lived experience to be in a course as a student or a teacher. And thinking about that student lens can really help explain some of the behaviors. Uh, this one I just put in for, again, looking at historical documents is fascinating because it just shows up so many parallels. Uh, so, wait, I think to go there. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Quote's coming up in a minute. So the thing that helps remind us about students and their life is that your course is not their only course. Your tutorial is not their only, they have, five other courses, seven other courses in some of the disciplines. And of course they have the rest of their lives, which is a whole other thing. So especially for those who are working uh, in the equity, diversity, and inclusion side, this is where that all comes in. It's your course has a context and that context can be very different for other or individual students. And that's incredibly powerful if you can remember that in designing your course, just keeping that other perspective in, uh, in mind when you do that. When you're talking about ethnicity, we're talking about family pressures, when you talk about educational experiences coming to Queens, whether it's international or domestic, and 
uh, sexual orientation, all these things that can play a role in how students are experiencing their entire university career, not just necessarily your course, but your course is one part of that whole experience. So that's where, to me, the EDII really fits in in thinking about the course and also the students in their larger context. Uh, this is the quote. So it also helps explain why some students, especially here I'm thinking family pressures and demands, uh, <laughs> The arts are underfunded, is the subtext. <laughs> Any guesses as to the century for this one? All of them, yeah, that's probably, you could rewrite this throughout the ages, absolutely. 1241 for this particular one. So yeah, the, the challenge of what do the students want out of this? We want them to learn, to broaden, to understand, and I just want a job. And again, if you think of the student perspective, goodness knows in our currently insecure world right now, having a little stability is something you can understand at least. You might not want it for all your students, but it's something you can relate to. And so, again, these struggles are real, these struggles are ongoing, and I think taking a look at that bigger picture and going, is this problem that I have today a new problem or has it been thought about before? It probably has been thought about before in teaching. We've been doing this for quite a while. All right. Um, what I want to go through next is just a little exploration of the, the guardrails, the, the best possible, worst possible kinds of extremes. And we're gonna do this for both the student side and the teaching side. So we're gonna start with the student side because the advantage is we've all been students. Not, all, not everyone's gonna be teaching, teaching next uh, week, but we've all been students. And what I'd like you to do is think about a positive experience that happened as a student, whether it's classroom, at home, working on a project, working with other students, whatever. Think, try to think about that. And we're gonna do a think pair, maybe share, time dependent. Uh, we'll talk that through with a neighbor and see if there's a common theme there. So think of that good experience. And if you have a different neighbor, pick a different neighbor. If you have the same neighbor, that's fine. Think of a positive event that was influential on you as a student. Go. <laughs> Alrighty, folks. Checking back in. We'll give it 10 seconds to cool down and wrap up the conversation. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna raise my hand, we'll see if this works. There we go, raise, if you can hear me, raise your hands. I haven't, tried, I haven't tried that trick before, thank you, Gavin. All right, uh, so thank you for that. It looked like everybody had a positive learning experience sometime. That was great. <laughs> All right. Uh, but guardrails come up two sides. We want to aim high, but we also want to avoid the low. Uh, I'd like you to try to think of a, l a less than positive <laughs> teaching experience. And I won't ask you to share these because we don't need to share the, the negative, but at least not locally. But think about one, and are there any that you thought, uh, you, yeah, give it 15 seconds to think about. They usually jump out pretty quick. <laughs> I'll take one or two samples just to give us an idea of things to avoid. One at the back there, please. Thanks. Oh, the problem is people at the side can't hear. It's, it's a weird acoustics in here. I appreciate the offer though. Back when I was in first year, I took a first year physics course and I didn't love physics. I'm a biology student, but I took it, had to. Um, and we would do eye clicker questions throughout the lecture, which is great active learning. But the issue is if none of us really understood the concept, the prof would then criticize all of us and call us stupid. So that wasn't necessarily great as a learning individual. So not so much active learning as active criticism. Like, oh, you really all suck. I know that now. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Another one over here. Oh, sorry, one in the back row there. Oh, sorry, was there one there? I missed it, sorry. Um, for me, it was just the sheer amount of people in my first and second year classes. Oh, it was okay. around 1,200, 1,300 students. I didn't do my undergrad here. Um, and it was overwhelming, especially transitioning from high school, which was, I think, like 20 people, 20, like 25, to that many. And it was really difficult to ask questions when you had to. Um, and so that was just awful, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just the scale becoming inhuman. I'm sure everyone in the 15th row was ready to ask questions, though, if they were, 
<laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so class size, and so that's sort of a structural thing. We have one more over here. Let's do one more. One more thing to avoid as institutions and teachers. I think we have different layers going on. Thanks. Well, this is kind of a different context because it was a upper year playwriting course, okay. um, but uh, it was for the final assignment when we had to write like a 10 page script. And um, the, the instructor, he kind of took issue, well, actually very much took issue with uh, the ideas of myself and a few other students when we presented them to the class and he openly criticized us in front of them and yeah, that wasn't a very uh, fun experience at the time. Absolutely not, yeah, especially when you, I'm sure you poured heart and soul into something like that if it's not for your thing that you're meant to own, yeah. Okay, so yeah, we, we can not do it so well sometimes <laughs> as an institution, as individuals. Um, and I think it's, again, this is a nice conversation at the CTL, but you can find things that drive students nuts and just do a quick scan of them there. Think of any that you've personally experienced. I'm guessing it's probably some of them. Um, but on the plus side, there are also things that you can be aware of and Try to avoid yourself. If you, again, the explicitness of the knowledge. If you know things are risks, then you can systematically or more methodically go through your own work and go, am I doing this? Am I doing, am I actually inconsistent in my grading? Or have I figured out how to work with my other TA that's marking the same assignment to make sure we're giving the students the same rough uh, experience? And a lot of these are ones that are under our control as TAs, as instructors. Uh, there are some things that are harder and they're more about communication, like how do I know what my students want out of this course and what am I giving them? And that might be poorly matched and you don't know that until you've kind of gotten the context of the course. So one of the things I think going into a new course, especially for new teachers is, where does this fit into the students' lives again? What's the larger context for this one tutorial I'm leading? What are the students also being asked to do in their other classes? And what are they going to in second year? What's, what's that larger perspective? And that can really help tie things in. When's the first midterm? Like, <laughs> prep me for that. That's the thing that a lot of first year students are gonna be worried about. So yeah, having in mind a list of things that can derail the student experience uh, feels like, yeah. <laughs> judgmental, being judgmental in a public forum right there, I just think is something that, that has to be highlighted as risky. Um, so that's the student side. So we've got some positive, got some negative sides to, to guide us there. Um, if we go back to the teacher side, so it's nice to know the students have a context, that's great, but at the end of the day, you're, you do only have control over the course that you're delivering. So here you are, you're faced with that monolith, this beast that you're working with. Let's do the bad side first. <laughs> so, um, oh my God. So this is a while ago, thank goodness, but I got to teach a mathematical course called Numerical Methods course, and when I took it as an undergrad, did not enjoy the instructional style at all, and I just, basically someone was reading slides, and like, that, that doesn't do it for me. So I just read the textbook, got a great mark, and I loved the material. I thought, this is so useful. Why isn't it presented in a way that makes it exciting for the students? And so I got this course to teach, and no one else wanted it, and like, this is great. I get to make it exciting for the students. <laughs> anyway, didn't work out quite so well. Let me share some of the feedback from that year. <laughs> so. <laughs> So if you've seen some bad comments, they can be bad, that's okay. <laughs> you can recover. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was the time. Um, do you have anything there? Can I, can, I just, can I just ask what you were doing that they <laughs> yeah. uh, The no soul in particular duped twice, twice they said that. <laughs> I, I don't, again, I think it's just that orthogonality. I know, that, that was not my intent, but clearly somewhere in the two angles on this course, it, was, it came out that way. Uh, I think it's that I set the expectations too high. I forgot that context again. I didn't think about all their other courses. And I was still a new teacher, so I didn't, I didn't align things very well. I didn't say, here's what I want you to do, and here's how we're gonna get there. So I think in a classic, I, I'm an expert, right? I did this, I enjoyed it, and I went and did you know, my master's and PhD on that area. I think you can get to here, and they're like, we're just down here, <laughs> don't, hurt, don't hurt us. I think that's where the no, no soul came from. So again, not meeting the students where they were. I appreciate the question, but yeah, it was, it, anyway. It got better, so little plug for the 
course redesign workshop? No, not workshop, it's course, institute, institute. Course redesign institute. I took this course to them and it went better for everybody, <laughs> students and myself included. It became a better course. They had projects that actually made sense and they built up, anyway. So Course Redesign Institute, highly recommend it for anyone who gets comments like this sometimes. Um, all right, let's think about the more positive side of this though. Uh, again, not everyone's taught, so let's just open the floor to people who have the, the more experienced folks. Anything that really worked well that you thought, yes, this is a success for me as a teacher. Perfect, thanks. I went over there. Go ahead, yeah. Oh, sorry, you're messing up my mic, yes. <laughs> oh. Perfect. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I um, taught a class last term, and it was borrowed a material from my previous professor, and so it was the lecture type. And so I started out that way and I just wasn't connecting, you know, and the students weren't really engaging. Okay. So what I did was I took some chunks out of that and um, during the class, we did an in-class research assignment where I walked around, they had to look up certain things right then and there. Okay. No, we, no grading, none of that stuff, no threat. And they got more involved. I connected, they connected with me. I, I thought it really kind of really changed the direction of the course. Nice. That, that yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, the dynamics, the fact that, yeah, you're working with them, they're working in front of you, they can ask immediately, it's not the 1300 student experience. Fantastic. Uh, let's take a second one. We'll go for the gentleman in the blue shirt there, Francesca. Hello, everyone. So I taught um, fluid mechanics uh, for the first time uh, this past winter for a second year engineering student. And they gave me this class and there was, uh, there was a piano on the left side. So I said, you know like, for those we should, <laughs> yeah, we should use that piano. So I, first class, I, um, you know, break, I broke the ice with the students telling them if there was someone able to play the piano. Of course, a few weeks went by, no one, uh, you know, jumped on the, the piano. But after maybe like it was week three, uh, a student uh, actually play the piano beautifully. Like I remember he did like Ludovico, I'm Italian, he did Ludovico Inaudi, it's uh, like an Italian composer, beautiful song. And from that moment on, every morning, even the 8.30 lecture, uh, it, would, it would play for about five minutes and it would ease the class. Everybody like would ask questions after that. They would stop by. I think, you know, it was a wonderful, like every class should have like a piano. Uh, <laughs> and we should ask students to like do open mic session before the class. I've met some of the players, uh, not every class, <laughs> but okay. All right, so do, again, if you have more to share, and I hope you do, please do share them at the meeting times. I'm also just being aware of the time myself and looking for the clock right over here. Yes, okay, so I think that's helpful. So again, thinking of things that really worked and things that, you know, that could, be, have, could have been done better. And again, through that student lens and through the instructor lens, that can be tremendously helpful. Um, I had a little spiel about, um, yeah, just that idea of remembering, put yourself in your student's shoes again. It's so easy to get caught up in the mechanics of your course design of the how, what, what are my lectures and what am I gonna talk about and what's the sequence of activities. Getting lost in that and forgetting, right, this is an experience for the students. There's a whole bigger context to that room, even, even in that room that you're in with them, that if you keep it in mind, it can be a much more compelling experience for both of you. So, um, doo -doo -doo. I was gonna do a little spiel on learning outcomes and student teacher models, but it's sort of extra as again, just I think there are ways to tie the student and the instructor lenses together and try to get a shared vision for what a course is. I think the more relevant one to think about for most people getting started, learning outcomes are more for the masochists and the accreditation <laughs> side. Um, I like them a lot. I know some people don't and they had a little poll about how much people hate them, but um, oh, I, let's do this, we have time. All right, so. <laughs> Put yourself in, in calculus 101, uh, APSC 171 here, and you do, what do you do? First, let's, let's imagine week seven. So you've been in the course for a while, you're doing stuff, and you go to OnCue, of course. For those who are new, OnCue is where everything is for course materials, is just where you go. Uh, so you see this, 
and learning outcomes are first prioritized there, top of the page, uh, after the key formulas to reference page. And I guess my question for you is, if we highlight that and we're in week seven, you got the routine down, what's the first thing that you do? All right, give it a quick show of hands. How many are A's? Excellent. How many are B's? Excellent, I'm right, okay, good. <laughs> Because my private educational heresy is that students don't care about learning outcomes. And that's because if, you've, if we've done our jobs as designers, it should be implicit. Everything they are asked to do goes to an outcome. They don't have to know it in a sentence form. I do to plan the course, but they don't have to know it because it's gonna be obvious. I want you to solve these kinds of problems. Well, you're gonna have some problems you're gonna solve. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's gonna be really clear. Um, so keep in mind, if you're struggling with learning outcomes, they're not for the students, uh, they're for you, for me. And again, it's not all students. There are three people who put their hands up and you gotta respect that. They should be available. I think they are a powerful tool if students want to use them. They're just, to me, they're not the front top page thing. Get to the good stuff that the students actually are gonna be doing. I think that's a better use of the, the first page on any website is stuff that is of most interest. So um, the other thing I was gonna mention is the other ways to think about teaching. So typically in a classroom, it's teacher-student, right? We talk, they listen, blah, blah, That's the model. But if you think about all the other kinds of experiences you've had, many of you coach an athlete, raise your hand, you've been coached by somebody, right, you learned, right? It wasn't a classroom setting, it wasn't necessarily long segments of teaching, it was usually you do something for a while, and then, let's change these two things and do it again. Oh, that is a whole other approach to a relationship between an expert and someone learning where you can get a lot of benefit. Uh, better customer I put in there just to piss off some of the <laughs> hardcore, they're not customers, they're students. Anyway, um, so uh, yeah, master apprentice, leader follower, and facilitator co-creator. It sounds like the discovery of uh, the terms and exploring that, it's you're letting the students do the work themselves and just kind of guiding them along the way. These are all different ways to think about what you do and what you see in the classroom and just they're familiar. I guess what I like about these is everyone has experience with them in some way. And you're like, oh, I've, I've learned there. Maybe I could make my classroom more like that because I found it was effective at teaching this kind of skill, this kind of understanding. So if you just have that list and think how maybe could I try something new in the relationship structure, it can be a powerful way to reimagine what's happening in the classroom. So. Um, Yes, I'm aware. Uh, <laughs> so we won't do that. Uh, also, it can be hard, like let's not lie. The, the simplest, less, least threatening model for a teacher in some ways is just to talk nonstop, don't let anybody else get a word in edgewise, and you're done. Whew, that's over. Uh, it's less threatening, it's very well defined, you've seen it a lot of times, but it's, it's, it's not always the best way, it's not, certainly not the only way. So it's worth thinking about the other ones, even if they are scary. Uh, it obviously has to be done in context with the students. I cannot do most of that kind of teaching in a 200 seat auditorium. It doesn't work the same way as it would in a small seminar. So you have to think about the context again and whether the students are experienced, all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, all right. So because I can't help myself, uh, there are two, two last quick tips. So if you are grading and responsible for grading, Queens now has the license for what's something called Crowdmark. It is awesome. Uh, it is an online grading platform either for assignments or on paper tests, and it has saved me cumulatively in my lifetime tens to hundreds of hours of my life. So if you're involved with marking in a large class and you're not using this, talk to me and I'll talk to your prof if you're a TA. <laughs> talk to me if you are a prof, and we'll get you set up. It is fantastic. Um, also, a surprising tool that I find, found a few years ago, uh, something called Beef Text. And what it does is it lets you just type in little short, random strings, and it expands it out to what you want. So my signature now is just like four keystrokes, and bam, there's my name. Oh, I'd like to put my full name. I've got a standard uh, rubric response for someone who got everything right. That's like four keystrokes. And it's just one of those things that just anything repetitive, again, this is the large class lens coming through, anything repetitive that you do, it's kind of nice to have a tool that helps you do that a little more efficiently. So. All right, wrap up, two last slides. Uh, feeling about classes next week. Raise your hand when we get to you. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, keeping nervous is perfect. It means you're on edge. It means you're on that, that cusp of uh, adrenaline and panic. It's great. Um, so as we head out, just a few thoughts to think about as you go through the rest of the day.